What's good, Knicks Nation? Alex Jeteris here, a.k.a. the Tratocaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. This time we are previewing the New York Knicks out in Chicago, not once, but twice. All right, they're going to be at the United Center once on, at, on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. on ESPN, and then back on the MSG Network at 8 p.m. on Friday. And who better to come preview this game and give us some draft knowledge as well is one, Corey Talba. All right, you could, he's a founder and curator of vibes over at No Ceilings. If you want to get good draft coverage, actually, not even good. It's great draft coverage. Make sure to go over to No Ceilings. All right, they got an awesome newsletter. They got a litany of podcasts. Make sure to go check them out. But while you're also here checking this show out, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys and make sure to head over to KnicksFanDV.com, which is presenting this show. All right, let's get into it. Corey, how are you doing, man? How are you feeling today? Alex, what is popping, man? I'm I'm ready to do this, man. I'm super excited to uh, chat it up. It's been a minute since I've been on Knicks Fan TV, but, you know, this feels like home to me. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm ready to get into it. Let's go, man. I mean, you you know, even though you're even though you are a Chicago Bulls fan living in New York, you are a New Yorker. You have a lot of Knicks yes. fans. You've been on the show. You give us all your draft knowledge. You give us your Chicago Bulls take. We bring you on because you know what you know, you know, man, you just know what's going on. So let's rip the bandaid off and jump right into this Chicago Bulls, man. Some would say that they haven't been performing up to expectations. What say you? I think that they actually are performing up to my personal expectations. I think that right now where they're at, you know, uh, last year, DeMar DeRozan was absolutely unstoppable in the clutch, right? And and I knew that there would be some regression to the mean. And DeRozan has been fantastic yet again uh, for all the people who thought he was going to have a little bit of fall off. But before the season, Zach Levine coming off a knee surgery, you know, he's having possibly the worst year uh, of his Bulls career sans that first year when, again, he was coming off a knee surgery. And uh, and we're still without Lonzo. So, you know, he's the guy that that makes this thing go. He's the reason that, you know, this Bulls team was in first place 50 games into last season. And, I you know, the knee injury scares me a lot. But with the roster, with what we have, you know, one of the big uh, knocks on the Bulls last year is they weren't beating any good teams. They bought, they beat Boston twice. You know, they they beat good teams this year, winning teams. So, you know, I, I think that if uh, Lonzo can come back relatively soon, there's a lot of mystery involved in that. And Zach Levine is starting to play better as his knee is healing. Mm -hmm. I, I think the Bulls can, you know, make a run towards the second half of the season, especially because they did have a, a hard schedule early on in the year. So where they're at right now, you know, I know every media outlet is saying the Bulls need to absolutely panic and start trading away everybody. <laughs> but I mean, they're not saying that about Miami or Atlanta, you know, all these other middle of the road teams. And I still think there's some upside for the Bulls as they potentially get healthy. So I, I they're playing up to my expectations, which I guess for me just means I had a lower bar for them coming in than than maybe, you know, the Bulls fans or or Bulls uh, brass did themselves. Well, you know, they're 11-15 right now. They're technically not even in the play-in. You just went through some lineup changes. We'll get your takes on that right now. But you mentioned Lonzo Ball. How do you feel about it, man? Because you st I see the reporting. I, I see the tweets. It's concerning, man. He <laughs> he's part of what makes the Chicago Bulls that what they were why they were so dominant at the beginning of last season. Defense, playmaking. What are your thoughts on him? It's it's bad. It seems very it's it's bad. It's there. It's shrouded in mystery, right? I mean, he has been out for a very long time, and there's still no set timetable for him to return. You know, every once in a while, we get Bulls beat writers, you know, showing like video of him working out, uh, you know, at their practice facility. So it's concerning. You know, he's young, and the knee problem. No one likes to hear that, especially not Bulls fans who dealt with Derrick Rose's knee injuries, you know, so uh, knee injuries and point guards seem to go hand in hand for the Bulls. But mm. again, like you said, I think that he's the guy that makes this thing run. And if you're the Bulls brass and you feel you they know what's going on more than anybody else does. And, and maybe they're just keeping it tight lipped and, you know, maybe he's on track to recover and it's nothing long term to worry about. Um, and if that's the case, then I don't think there's any reason for anybody to panic. And, you know, we just got to be patient until he returns. If it is, you know, the kind of thing where it's like, 
we're approaching the all-star break and it's like, oh, we don't know when he's coming back. Then at this point, he's going to miss what a season and a half potentially. And right. then you're, you're starting to get real nervous about that because that seems like a very bad knee injury. Uh, and, and then, you know, we can approach the off season, however, you know, that plays out, but, uh, I'm concerned just cause there's not a lot of news, but at the same time, I guess, you know, I, I can't panic cause I don't have any definitive answer, but, nor does anybody else, but it, it's definitely concerning. Yeah, man. And I would be concerned too. Juan's just like one of my guys. I, I liked him as a point guard. I want him to be a Nick at one point, but all the injuries are concerning, but let's, let's talk about these lineup changes because you don't have uh Lonzo ball so recently they just went through some lineup changes you want to go into some of that because I think it was who is it Ayo uh Dosumo who was starting as well and I don't know who else what other Io, uh, Io and Patrick Williams were starting at at the point guard and, and power forward position um Billy Donovan made a an adjustment a few games ago to bring in Alex Caruso as a starter and Javante Green as a starter that was pretty short lived because uh, Caruso was dealing with like a back thing right now. Mm. So Io was back in the lineup. Javante Green has a knee thing. He returned last game, but he only played 14 minutes and he came off the bench. So uh, I'm not sure what the lineup is going to look like for these Knicks contests. Um, the idea, the plan is, is that, you know, Caruso and Javante Green are guys who are bringing incredible energy. I mean, Alex Caruso's, you know, plus minus is like plus 1000 when he's on the floor. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that seemed like an obvious move. It, it was just very short lived. So we'll see what the injury status is. I don't ever like to hear back stuff either. Back stuff is not something that is just like, all right, it's gone. And we don't have to deal with that anymore, especially from our most important defender. Um, and Javon Day Green, like you said, he's back. Um, he's playing limited minutes. Maybe he'll see more time. I don't know if he'll be coming off the bench or Patrick Williams will be starting. But uh, just the fact that we're having a conversation about Javon Day Green starting over Patrick Williams is another thing that actually does, you know, kind of concern me as a Bulls fan. But uh, yeah, I, the, the, I would say the starting lineup is a mystery other than Zach, Vooch, and Damar are going to be the three guys locked in, and then the rest is going to be up to health. <laughs> <laughs> and so like what that what that short lineup stint was it actually working did you like it or like do you think yeah i was gonna go back I, to it or what, what's I, the, what are the thoughts i think that he will um i could see him sticking with patrick williams as a starter and going to caruso i think io i have been good you know he, he's been good but has he been an impact guy you know he's a second year player who was a second round pick he's exceeded everyone's expectations for him uh, but right now, you know, he looks like maybe he's a guy that you bring off the bench, kind of change, play a little faster because the Bulls defense with Levine, DeRozan and Vooch, you know, we need those defensive disruptors. And and IO is really good in certain scenarios. Like he has historically just absolutely shut down uh, New York arch nemesis Trey Young. And he did it again uh, in their last game. But you know, he's not going to be a guy that you can have that impact on every single matchup. Caruso is one of the most versatile defenders in the league. He's mm -hmm. a guy that is just so smart. And outside of like being able to uh, be disruptive on ball, he's so good at rotating over and, and, you know, he's, he's a havoc wreaker. Going back to Lonzo, it was Lonzo and Caruso, that pairing, that was the reason that they were able to play so fast, get so many easy buckets and, and look so good in transition. So uh, I, I definitely think Caruso would be the guy, uh, especially because, on that bench, you give Io a guy uh, as a guy who can play change of pace, and then you have Gordon Dragic coming out, being able to you know play a little bit in between and space the floor and just be a veteran presence. But uh, again, Pat's Pat's a guy that um, you know I think maybe they stick with. He's he's having a fine year, you know. <laughs> I think he's completely lived up to my expectations of him as a player. Uh, I okay. think Bulls fans seeing the number four pick and seeing yeah. a guy that looks like him who fits the modern NBA. He's definitely been a disappointment to, to Bulls fans. But you know, if, if you go into the archives of uh, Knicks fan TV on, yes. on draft night in 2020, I was on the show and my reaction is there for all to see on how I felt about the selection of Patrick Williams. Oh, where that I said, was great. <laughs> it was, it's fine. I think my reaction literally might've been, it's fine. And that's like how I describe like Patrick Williams is fine. Like he's a first little defender. He hits open shots. Um, I would love to see Billy kind of use him as a, a small ball five a little bit more often. I think that could be something interesting and uh, that could really help the offense and, and kind of give us a look defensively. But uh, 
I, I think Derek Jones Jr. is another guy who might get looks uh, against the Knicks. Mm. He was really impactful against the Hawks. And honestly, I feel like he impacts the game every time he plays extended minutes. He, he's – I'm – uh, one of the Bulls fans who's been very happy with Billy Donovan throughout his tenure. But the one thing I always say is like, I really want more Derek Jones Jr. minutes. He's just athletic. He's long, yeah. you know, he's, he's one of these disruptors. He can guard like multiple positions. So I think he's a guy that, um, you know, is potentially going to get some extended run depending on, you know, what the, the injury situations are. Cause you know, he's coming off a strong performance against Atlanta. For sure, for sure. And, you know, you mentioned that 2020 draft night. I was with you on that panel. And yeah, <laughs> you. I remember the whole conversation about Patrick Williams to the Bulls, too, because we all thought, especially you, you thought it was all smoke and mirrors. You're yeah. like, eh, I think this is a lot of hype, man. I don't really know if the Chicago... And then Chicago Bulls take him at number four, and your face was like, wow, this is not... And I could see it all <laughs> running through your brain. It was like, this is not smoke and mirrors. We're doing this. And that's why you're like, this is fine. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. This is fine. I see the fire just going around you. You're like trying to drink your cup of coffee. This is fine. Everything's fine. I but compared hey. him to I compared him to Marvin Williams. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> he's gonna play in the NBA a long time, but like he's fine. <laughs> and we're still here where it's it's just fine. Hey, That's but moving it. along, you br you brought up a coach, Billy Donovan. Man, I gotta ask you how you said you've been pleased with his performance as a head coach so far. Go into that, man. Like, how, what have you liked that Billy Donovan has done for the Chicago Bulls up until this point? I mean, you know, you have to realize that as a Bulls fan, we're coming off of the Fred Hoiberg and Jim Boylan Oof. era. You know, <laughs> like the the Jim Boylan era is something that I truly cannot believe happened. Yeah, you know, like I sometimes I wonder if it was a figment of my imagination. Like no, it, it was, was just not. he he is <laughs> I, like I'm not a guy as a coach myself. Like I'm not a guy who really rags on coaches because I I think that sometimes fans kind of overreact to the decisions. You know, just because the answer wasn't what was on the court doesn't mean that it, the answer is on the bench. You know what I mean? Like that's mm -hmm. the type of that, that's how I feel a lot of times. Not to say that coaches are infallible. Obviously, they they make mistakes. You know, I'm I'm sure you can attest to tips, uh, the man. coaching situation uh <laughs> but billy donovan is he's a professional the guys are prepared you know like he he garners respect of the team and he's just had a ton of success he knows what he's doing um he he's given freedom to these young players he threw io into the fire early on as a second round pick like he's not afraid to to do things like that um but he has the roster he has you know like there there's no secret sauce on the bench there's no magic answer for for the fixing unless there's there's roster moves so um and or the roster gets healthy so you know for me like i, I i'm fine with him I, I don't think there's a ton of coaches out on the market that would get remarkably different results than the bulls have had since you know the lonzo caruso went out last season and, and heading into this season given the situations again zach levine having the worst season of his career because he had knee surgery he he lacked pop and burst and all the things that you know zach levine is capable of he couldn't bring to the table uh this early on this year he's starting to round into form mm -hmm. uh vooch is who he is right like you can say what you want about that trade was it an overpay you know probably probably looks a little bit worse because the magic actually hit on their draft pick i i don't think if you know uh the magic had drafted jonathan kaminga people would be harp harping on that trade nearly as much right or, or right. somebody else where it looked but they hit on you know a potential all-star you know multi-time all-star um but he's a solid player that He's one of the reasons that DeMar DeRozan wanted to commit. They were, few, you know, teammates in college. Like, you know, the, these are the guys that they have. He's done a fine job. And I don't know if there are coaches on the market that would do any better. So I, I'm a big fan. And, you know, the, everybody talks positive. Like, all his players around the league always talk positively about him. So I'm I'm happy with him. I mean, he, was, he did an impressive job with OKC before he went to Chicago where – they had Chris Paul, you know, you had uh, Shea Gilders Alexander, yeah. you had um, who else was it? Dennis, Dennis Schroeder. Dennis Schroeder, yeah. yeah Dennis Schroeder. Three, that team, three guard lineup. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone was clowning that lineup going into that season. And then look, they make the playoffs. They're in the bubble. They take Houston to, to seven yeah. game series. 
you know, you got to tip your hat, not only to the players, but Billy Donovan for being able to put those guys yeah. in that, in that situation, man. And, you know, I kind of feel the same way as a Knicks fan when it comes to Tibbs. Like I know Tibbs makes some boneheaded decisions. He's stubborn when it comes to rotations. He's stubborn to give guys a shot because he's always going to rely on the veterans because if they have made it there that long, there's a reason why. And for the young guys, you, you know, it's, he really is, what is it? He's very conservative when it comes to like what he wants to do, right? And you need a little bit more of like optimism, risk taking. And he's not really that type of guy when he's trying to coach for a job, especially when you're on your third job. So I get it. But there's still some times where I'm like, yo, man, why'd you make these lineup changes tonight? Like we played against Steven Adams. He decided to go small ball. I'm like, as much as I want to see small ball, it is not against Steven Adams. All right. I do not need to see Obi Toppin and Julius Randle going against one of the best offensive rebounders. Knicks fans and wanted it. You want it. You want it. Hey, look, you got it. Hey, look, man. And there's some matches where it works. But you know what? At the same time, like it all depends on this. It all comes down to the situation, yeah, of course. right? It all comes down to the situation, as you know. But you're talking about Billy Donovan. How would you feel about, continuing, I should say, on Dil Billy Donovan, how would you feel about him benching Zach Levine? Because that, you know, set the Twitter roll to blaze. Levine, you know, went back to trusting his coach. That's at least what the tweet, how I read the tweet. What were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you read the, like, the full quote of, you know, how he reacted to being benched. I, I think it was definitely taken out of context, which, you know, is shocking in this Twitter age that, you know, just chopping up a little <laughs> segment would make the rounds like that. I'm, I was, I was Who wants on Twitter. What? <laughs> <laughs> right. What? <laughs> oh, come on. I don't want to get suspended. Um, but I, I think that, you know, like as a coach, he, he has the respect that he's able to do that and you could still win the respect back. Like when Jim Boylan did that, uh, you know, when he was coaching the suicides, he, he like, Oh God, I, I don't even want to get into the, the specifics of what he was doing. Uh, but he benched Zach and then Zach came out against the Hornets the next night, hit a game winner. I think he had like 49, maybe or something like that. Like, so he, he responded, he responded to the next game here too. You know, I, I, he's a guy that, well, maybe he was emotional in the moment. He took accountability for it. He was like, I called my dad. My dad told me I played like garbage and I got to play better next game. So I think that's one of the positives about Zach Levine is that, you know, while he may have that superstar ego, he does have somebody in his life who could check him and kind of be like, when well, mm. you just like stop making excuses, work harder. And, and he owns up to that and he'll do that. And I think that's why when he's healthy, he's gotten better like five years in a row, right? Like every time somebody said like, this is probably the best he could be, he's upped his play. Um, and again, like this year, he's frustrated. He's used to playing at an all-star level now. So recovering from a knee injury and maybe not being able to get to the same spots that he's been able to get to hit the tough shots, get to the hole as easily, get as much, you know, lift, you know, dunk the ball like he used to. That's frustrating. So I think it was a lot of different factors. And, and I don't think there was like this crazy disconnect with his coach, other than the fact that like he wasn't playing well, his coach wanted to go a different direction. So he came back. He had a good all-around game the next night. And obviously, if if that's how he's responding, I guess that means that Billy Donovan was right, right? Like, if, if mm. he's doing more all-around in the next game, it, it, he got the message. And, and he's been playing better since that moment. So, uh, again, I think it's positives. He's – when you come back from a knee injury – it's going to take time and it's going to be, you, you need patience and Chicago, New York, these are big markets. They're teams that, you know, a lot of people have their eyeballs on. So uh, patience is hard in these markets. Right. So absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's a non story overall. It was just kind of a blip on the radar of an 82 game season for a guy who was, you know, kind of struggling. Well, you know, it's the NBA, man. We like to make we yeah. like to make things out of nothing sometimes. But I know Knicks fans right now are hearing the accountability for Zach Levine by Billy Donovan, hearing that he has somebody in his life to just be like, as he says, his father, right? Saying, yeah. hey, man, you played like trash last game. Comes back out, plays really well. I know Knicks fans are hearing that, and they're thinking about where is Tibbs holding Julius Randle? I'm not going to talk about Julius Randle's outside life. I don't know, but I know it's going to come down to – what about Tibbs? Because we saw last season, Randall had moments, and even beginnings of par parts of this season where he wasn't playing defense, being very lax last season, didn't really pass the ball. Now you could say, hey, Julius Randall had a lot to shoulder because he was that guy last season trying to replicate the year he had before. Still, there's some there's some truth to saying 
where is the accountability for a player that's not playing well and showing him, hey, you cannot go out here and when you're considered a leader for this team and put out garbage like that. I know Knicks fans are, are, are loving that Billy Donovan did that and they're asking Tibbs, a guy from Chicago, by the way, that coached yep. your team. Yep. You know, where and, is and that? that's and that and it, it is strange because Tibbs, like, don't get me wrong, he is stubborn in the way that he trusts his veterans. You know, like um I remember by the end of his tenure, his last year, which you know, the Bulls were a fine team that year, like uh they were running so many like DHOs and like high post actions with Joe Kim Noah. Uh, Nick's legend, by the way, that he, uh, you know, that I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that I, I was just like, I, I can't take this anymore. Like, what do we, is it like this? How is this our best option? Like I get it with Tibbs. He's stubborn with, and, and with the trust that he has in his guys. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Julius is, he doesn't seem like a fun hang when things aren't going his way. And he, uh, Tibbs does need to kind of have moments where he could just be like, we have Obi. Like we spent a lottery pick on this kid. Like if you're not bringing it, we have options. And and he definitely has not historically done that. So I, you know, I understand the frustrations, and I, I I do think that while some of Nick's fandom has been a little harsh on the Tibbs hate, it's not to say that he's without fault and he doesn't have things sure. that he absolutely needs to improve on, and and that's one of them. Yeah, for sure. And I think he has improved on certain things, but we're not going to go into the whole things that Tibbs has improved on. <laughs> We're going to keep talking about Zach Levine, though, because, yeah. you know, talk about the benching. Now we have Adrian Wojnarowski, right? We start off this pod saying, or the show saying, should they really tear it down? Should there be a fire sale? Like, you know, that's what you that's what you brought up. Well, Adrian Wojnarowski comes through, says, hey, you know, brings up the Bulls, brings up the Knicks, saying look out for Zach Levine as being one of those options. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's something that is, is actually – that could fruition come to fruition, I should say. <laughs> uh, well, I believe that whoa, the full context was whoa saying the Bulls are not putting Zach Levine, you know, they're not making him available, but the Knicks are keeping tabs, which uh, again, shocking that the Knicks would be keeping tabs on, you know, high profile players. That's historically never happened in New York, right? Never. Um, I don't know, man. I, I don't think that this Knicks thing makes a ton of sense for either side. For one, like I was playing on the trade machine and I, I, you definitely need like a third team to get involved. Cause Zach Levine makes a good amount of money and yeah. uh, the Knicks just don't have the contracts to make it work. Cause if you're going to tear it down, like you want contracts that don't go past next season, probably clear cap. And mm. it's like, they're not taking Julius Randall's big contracts. They're not taking, you know, Evan Fournier's years, or, you know, maybe they would take Fournier because I think he's got a, a team option on that third year, but uh, I just don't think they have the contracts. And I don't know if the Knicks fandom would be happy with what the Bulls would be asking as far as player and, and pick wise from, from the team. But he also seems like a finishing guy. Like he's a guy that you trade for when you're like close and you need to take yes. the next step towards a championship. And I don't think the Knicks are at that point either, you know? So and and not to mention just fit wise, like I think Jalen Brunson is was one of the best free agent signings of last year. I think you know I know he's slumping right now, but he's a tremendous player who has proved his game on the biggest stage, dating back to college. Like he's just a big time player in big time moments. But he's a small guard. Zach Levine is definitely not known to be a two way player. And then, you know, I'd imagine in the scenario, let's say the Knicks keep R.J. Barrett. Like, I just don't know how I feel about that trio in the backcourt. I don't love the versatility. I don't love the defensive impact between the three of them. So I, I don't even I don't think there's a fit on on either side for a trade or it, I don't think it really makes sense either way. Yeah, and I and I agree with you on that. I think Zach Levine is that player that, you know, on a team that's close to championship contending, that's who you go make that last move for. You know, it's like for sure. when you watch the NFL and you watch what the Rams do and they're like, oh, okay, we'll trade all of our first round picks because we're nowhere that close to go winning a Super Bowl. That's when you make those type of moves. I agree 100%. The thing, I, I do like Zach Levine's game. He would definitely help this team because what the Knicks are missing is a shot creator, somebody who constantly moves off ball. He was just a quick decision maker. As soon as he gets the ball, like he either knows he's going to make a step back shot. He's either going to attack the lane. He He's just so quick with, with his thought process. We're missing 
more players like that. Quentin Grimes can do it. Outside of that, you know, Randall's more, he holds the rock for a little too long, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Not, you know, he, he's got that black hole tendency a little bit yeah. where it's like, it just stops the ball movement. Same thing with RJ. RJ has his blinders on. He, he has like two modes, which either shooting a three going to the lane. That's why I think Zach Levine would definitely help this team, but you're right. Like what contracts are you, are you moving? And then when you start thinking about the fit, like you're not, they're not trading. If you're bringing Levine, you're not getting rid of Randall. Fournier is probably the only contract. I don't know why, if you would want Rose and for like and Fournier, and then who else do you want? Like I, have the youth to go with, with that with the draft capital. What do you even like, think the draft capital will be asked for Zach Levine? Well, that first of, of all, the the problem is like Zach's making a good amount of money, so you need like a ton of con. Like it, it would have to be like a four for one trade type of thing, and I don't even know the logistics of that, which is why I think there would need to be a third team. Uh, draft capital. I mean, I look at somewhere probably in between Dejounte Murray and like Donovan Mitchell. You know, like, I mean, that's the market went absolutely berserk last offseason, right? Between Gobert, Mitchell, and Murray, like, these picks are are kind of really valuable. And you're looking at a long-term locked-up asset, uh, somebody who is still in his prime, who has gotten better every single year that he's been healthy. So I, I think the Bulls, if they were going to part with him, and and again, I don't think they want to, I think the asking price is, is really high, which, again, is why I think it's funny that all of these big time uh, media outlets are like in panic mode about the bull situation. When, if they do decide to blow it up, like between the assets you would get from DeRozan, Levine and Caruso, like all of a sudden you're looking at another team where you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe they have like 12 picks in the next four years or whatever. <laughs> you're like, you know, so it's like, it, I think the bulls are in a fine position to be patient. You know, Zach's locked up long-term they have DeMar again and they can extend him if, if they want to, um, but I, I think that outside of just the, the capital, like I don't think you get him without like two of their young guys. And, and that means like Grimes and I don't know, quickly, you know, like, and, and who knows, maybe Cam Reddish is even like a throw in type of guy. If this is an in season trade, Do so, you Cam Reddish? <laughs> uh, I mean, the bulls don't have a, a second to, to trade since they had to forfeit it from the Lonzo uh, situation, but uh, <laughs> I would, I would take him for a second. I mean, I, look, I was never a Cam Reddish guy. Like, you know, even dating back to Duke, I was like, he looks awesome, but like, he's just not good. <laughs> you know, like he has a moment. He's, he's, he's an idea guy. Like anybody watching this out there has probably been in a relationship with someone where you're like, this person is beautiful. They're funny. You know, I love hanging out with them. And then you break, you know, they break up with you and you realize like they treated you poorly they lied to you a lot they made excuses like you know they always made you like anxious and uneasy like they just the cam love is with, about to kill you right you're now, in lady. love with the idea of cam reddish you are in love with the idea you don't love cam reddish you love the idea of cam reddish this is not paul george he's cam reddish he was bad at duke he was bad in atlanta and he's been you know mediocre to bad in new york yeah like this is just who he is he is a tease he is a tease cam JD, reddish. if you're listening right now my man Put the put the head put the earmuffs on. I know you don't want to hear this J, right now. Like JD, Cam Reddish is the girl you've been dancing with at the club all night until the <laughs> lights come on. The lights come on, and you're like, oh, that's not what I thought. Who I thought I was dancing with. Woof. <laughs> oh man. But I take wow. him for a second. <laughs> well, take it for a second. I, I mean, look, that's I mean, that's essentially what the Knicks did, right? They trade a, a high top draft pick for cam just to see to kick the tires and now they're ready to move off of them sometimes so, when the lights come on that's the that's the girl you got to go home with you know oh, man woof <laughs> <laughs> these these analogies are going going places i love it i love it um but yeah look so i so you would say it'd be getting back on the trade topic so you're thinking quickly grimes throwing a cam you got 40 in there as well let's say to make the, the contracts work like try to the, make the contracts work. What do you think? Like three first rounders? I mean, first I, rounders? I would say it's like three in a swap, probably. Three in a that, swap. That's that's probably what I would guess. That's the market, right? Like yeah. DeJounte Murray, he got three, I believe. Uh or like two, two in a two, swap. Yeah, it was two first. I think it was two, two in first a swap. rounders. Yeah, I think in a swap. Yeah. Donovan so Mitchell got, got three and two swaps. Yeah. And so Gobert, I don't know, a thousand, a thousand picks was for Gobert. <laughs> Go, the Gobert trade is just an anomaly. Okay, I will get that trade. It's like that was highway robbery. Okay, someone got little, uh, someone thought they were buying a Rolex, 
and they got so, they got yeah. something like Relax. All right, that's exactly that's right. what they got. Um, <laughs> but I think like the three, I think the three first rounders with the pick swap is what the asking price because I don't think Levine is there with what Mitchell can be. And no, Mitchell I agree. Is, and Mitchell is still younger than Levine. And then you look at Dejounte Murray and what, like Dejounte Murray skill set. Levine has a better, in my opinion, skill set than Dejounte Murray just yeah. offensively. So I, I agree. It's somewhere. It's somewhere to me in, in the middle uh, of that. There's three matchups that I'm looking at that are going to be keys for these games. One is going to be RJ Barrett versus DeMar DeRozan. We saw last season, you know, that was always the guy RJ was guarding. I mean, he even had a good, he had a good defensive possession on DeMar when it came for the, it was a first win against the Chicago Bulls last season, mm. guarded DeMar really well. RJ's defense has been a little lackluster this season, like unlike last year. I don't know if it's because he put it, put on weight, trying to be a little bit more stronger, be a little bit more brolic, as we would say in New York. But I don't know, man. Uh, that's that's the guy who I'm seeing right now is going to be for that matchup. <clears throat> Another matchup is definitely going to be Mitchell Robinson versus uh, Vucevic because centers, man, I want to see Mitch. I know he's usually had trouble guarding offensive-driven centers, and Vuce is a good offensive player so that's another match i'm looking at for this game and then the last one the last one i'm looking at is none other than quentin grimes versus zach levine bro because mm. zach levine as i talked as i talked about earlier very athletic he's twitchy he can get to the rim with ease and quentin grimes has i think the best athleticism and perimeter defense to keep up with zach levine those are my three key matchups for the starting rotations what do you think about them and is there any other matchups that you were going to have for this game maybe the the patrick williams revenge game after you know mitch took him out for uh the season <laughs> last year <laughs> oh brother bulls fans were attacking Knicks fans <laughs> left and right for that one sheesh it was an accident my man it was an accident <laughs> no i th i think you nailed it and, and honestly i think the matchup i'm most afraid of is the vooch mitchell robinson matchup i feel like mitchell robinson always gives the bulls a ton of problems just with his length defensively uh his his rebounding um and his rim gravity you know and especially when you, you have you know playmakers like the knicks have now and i i think he's a guy that always gives me the like oh we got to deal with this guy again so i don't know hopefully the bulls mm -hmm. get him into a little bit of foul trouble uh but otherwise yeah those, those are the matchups right i mean they're grimes is is this new defense that the Knicks are playing, it, it feels like he's one of the guys that has spearheaded it. And um, with Zach, you know, he's playing well now, but he still is, you know, recovering from that knee injury. Maybe that slowed down version, Quentin Grimes can give him a lot of trouble. And and when guys play Zach, you know, really tight, there are times where he tends to kind of force it a little bit and, and try to do mm -hmm. a little bit too much settle. I think Quentin Grimes is definitely has the potential to, uh, you know, force him into some tough shots. So I, I definitely think those are the matchups. I, I think DeRozan, I'm at the point where I just feel so comfortable with whoever guards him. It doesn't matter. I, I think he's, he gets to his spots. He does whatever he wants. And, you know, if the Knicks are going to guard DeRozan just straight up one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with RJ, I feel fine about that matchup as a Bulls fan. But I think the other two matchups do have the potential to kind of, you know, bring the the worst out of both of those guys. And, you know, I, I think that it's like, hopefully Andre Drummond doesn't have to come in and, and play like, you know, big minutes against Mitchell Robinson. Although Andre Drummond, I mean, Drummond, Drummond has given Mitch his problems in the past. I'm not going to yeah, lie. You know, he's a big guy. So I, I guess this year it is good that they do have that, that option that they have a big guy to lean in, uh, lean on like that. But those are the three key matchups for sure. Yeah. You know, like I look at it and you talked about the Knicks, uh, surging defense right now. Quentin Grimes being one of the the spearheads of that. It's also Miles McBride, Emmanuel. Yeah. Those those trio right there have really has have really changed the perimeter defense because the Knicks were allowing so many three point shooting. You know now the Knicks are now are leading over these last four games. They're number one in defensive net in defensive rating. So those guys alone, plus Mitch being a safety valve, you know, and cleaning up. Anyone who's trying to attack the lane, that's been just, it's been game changing, honestly, watching this type of defense. But it'll be a good test because the Chicago Bulls over the last four games are right now second in the NBA with the amount of points that you've been putting up. Even though you're two and two, your guys are putting up a lot of points. So it'll be interesting to see how the Knicks are going to be able to handle this because, look, 
we're 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 a good scoring team, but we're not a good three point sh- shooting team. Like a lot mm. of our points are in the paint, and yes, they're effective doing that. But when you see the Chicago Bulls who are shooting forty one percent right now from three over the last four games, that that's going to be a good challenge, and we're going to really get some a true test here to see how where this perimeter defense stands. But the next part I got to ask, man, is the is the battle of the benches because in the past it's always the Knicks we're looking towards our second unit with being led by Derrick Rose, right? It's been Derrick Rose and man quickly Obi top in, uh, throw in whoever, whether it was Alec Burks, right? Uh, as, as that guy on your wing with Taj Gibson and Nerlens Noel or whoever, right? And now I'm looking at this second unit and I'm very, I'm, I'm intrigued because we don't really have that type of, Offensive, pr- offensive presence as we now once have. Now it's more defense oriented. And what Tibbs has now done is staggered either Randall or RJ to be with that second unit to give them that scoring punch, as well as Quentin Grimes to some extent. Uh, not Quentin Grimes for a, a scoring punch, but just some d- more defensive presence. How do you feel about the Bulls second unit going against the Knicks new defensive oriented second unit? Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll we'll see regarding the health of you know, some of the guys that would either be leading their bench or maybe starting. I think that's one thing, but uh, this year, I, the Bulls bench has been phenomenal. Honestly, you know, I mean, Goran Dragic has uh, Mm -hmm. looked terrific. Uh, Andre Drummond has been really good and gives them something that they don't have as, you know, uh, as far as rim gravity goes, you know, Kobe white is who he is. (laughs) I, I kind of wish that, you know, Kobe white for Cam Reddish. I don't know who says no, but, (laughs) <laughs> we're at this point of the we're at this point of the show kobe White. yeah you know but again like it, javante green I, he's a guy that could swing a game with his play off the bench you know he is such a ball of energy especially at the uc that you know he's a guy that all of a sudden you look at the box score and he's got you know 11 points seven rebounds three assists two steals and a block and you're like what just happened and he's mm-hmm. you know on like a two breakaway dunks that has the UC rocking. So I, the bench has in a lot of ways, um, you know, sparked the, the positives for the bulls this year. So if, if this team, if Caruso can come back and he's actually playing and uh, you know, whether that is him off the bench or IO off the bench, it gives them, you know, another guy to kind of add to this team um, that, you know, gives them a, a shot at, closing gaps that you know maybe defensively the starters have have gotten the the bulls off to with their slow starts yeah and and you saying that and i'm thinking like for for now we'll get the knicks right and we're not we're without obi Toppin right now we're we're using an isaiah hartenstein and a jericho sims front court right now having hartenstein at the four jayco at the five uh and we also have you know just quickly induced being those guys off the bench so scoring wise it's been all up and down, so it will be it will be interesting to see which team gets it going first. Because I feel like either either one of these benches, that's what it just takes one player. I think is going to be quickly who's going to be that guy off the bench that for us needs to get going. Who would be that? Who would be on your side for for the offense to get going coming off the bench? Uh, I mean, uh, if Kobe White has one of those games, uh, mm-hmm. and which he's had Makes against sense. against the Knicks, you know, yes, similarly, you know, guy who can catch fire, but. I, the Bulls bench, I think what I like about them is that they kind of do it collectively. You know, they don't have to kind of rely on one guy to get hot or not to, you know, kind of perform. I think that's the benefit of having vets like, you know, Drogic, like um, Drummond uh, come off the bench. A guy like Javante Green, who's going to bring energy regardless if he's hitting shots or not. So I, I don't know if there's one guy outside of Kobe who you could be like, oh, he's going to go, you know, he he can go off and swing it. I think for the Bulls, the bench is what brings their defensive energy that maybe they don't necessarily always get from, you know, their quote unquote big three. Mm, okay. Well, this is going to be a good matchup, Corey. This will be a good yeah, matchup. It Before, always is. <laughs> it, it always is. It's always interesting. So and look, we got that old historic rivalry as well, Knicks versus yes. Chicago versus Bulls. So it'll be a good one for this week, facing each other twice. But before we get you out of here, what do you think the final score is for both games? Oof. Uh, I think it's got the potential to be a real defensive uh, battle. Let's say 105-103. 
102. I'm going to go Chicago in the first game. And then let's go... Let's go 103 to 97, New York in in the second game. Ooh, look at this! You're giving you're giving the Knicks. You're giving coming on this show. You're not gonna, you're not even going to take I, the sweep. You're I respect the-, the Knicks, man. I respect okay. the Knicks. I, I you, what was their over under this year? Was it like 37 something like that again? Like 37, was, 38 and a half somewhere. somewhere yeah, I was like, come on, like, they're good. They're good. They're they're a fine team. You know, like, That's the word. It's a it's a fi- we got a fine team over here. Okay? They're a fine, a fine team. team. We're a fine team. They're a professional basketball team. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, on the other hand, I don't think I can be that 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 gracious to give the Chicago Bulls a, a win this week, just because. Look, man, <laughs> just the just the hatred, the animosity. I I, I can't do it. So I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the sweep this week. Okay. I'm gonna take the sweep for the Knicks. They're gonna go on a. I know everyone's listening. A six game winning streak. Holy cow. Wow, that'll be that'll be something. But I feel like the Knicks with this new improved defense, they're they're doing something special right now. Is this will be the test though? This will be the test. I'm gonna see. I'm with you though. It's gonna be a low scoring game. I'm gonna take the first one to be. I think it will be. I'm gonna go 105. I like the 105. I like the 105, 101 Knicks first one. I think the next one where they see each other is going to be absolutely garbage. <laughs> I think it'll be, I think we're going to see like, oof. I know teams are scoring high. I'm, I'm going to go 101.97 Knicks again. Okay. Yeah, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm, that's where I'm ending this. But Corey, thank you so much for hopping on this show. Really appreciate it. Please let the listeners know where they can find your work if you got anything coming up. Yeah, you can find me uh, on Twitter at Corey Tulliba and uh, the NBA Draft Dude on YouTube. Uh, the No Ceilings NBA podcast, uh, five days a week. We got five different shows on that feed. I am up on Thursdays. And uh, if you subscribe to No Ceilings NBA.com, it is absolutely free. We deliver written work on uh, young prospects all over the world and including the NBA. Uh, Monday through Friday, 9 o'clock a.m. in your inbox. It's free. Subscribe. All the cool kids are doing it. And uh, you'll find all of the stuff that we got going on there. We're on TikTok, if that's your thing, you know, no ceilings NBA. So we're we're doing cool things there, showing like behind the scenes, you know, uh, shooting mechanics from all the different prospects. Really, really cool stuff. A lot of uh, great breakdowns. And if you want to prepare for the draft because you got a couple of picks, there's not going to be a better spot than, than no ceilings on the internet. So that's that's the spot. Absolutely, and I and I wholeheartedly agree. Make sure to go subscribe for the newsletter. Go check out all the pods. They do great work over there. Really give you some great in-depth, nuanced analysis of all the prospects coming out, no matter whether in college, international, overtime. These guys give you the 411 on all these players. And honestly, I'm smarter after reading it. Like I, I go to it just to make sure I get my, my draft knowledge on whenever we're in that period. And as a Knicks fan for, for so many years, where have you been, Corey? Because this is the stuff that I needed in the past, man. This I've is been, the stuff I've I needed. Been, I've been around the last few years. Look, if Knicks fans, I'll be at the Garden covering the CBS Sports Classic uh, on Sunday. So if you see me, come say what up. Um, because and, and I'll answer all your draft questions that you have that, uh, you know, going forward and as you prepare to, to take advantage of this Dallas pick. Yeah, he's going to be there at the Kentucky game. So make sure to go re- reach out to Corey if you got any draft questions. But Corey, thank you once again for coming on the show. And for Knicks Nation, thank you for tuning in once again. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to follow Corey and check out all the good work over at No Ceilings. And also, make sure to go check out KnicksFanTV.com, which this show is always presented by. You can catch us later after all those go- these games this week for the post-game live. And make sure to, ch- to uh, check into KnicksFanTV.com for Remy's game recaps post-game recaps you can always catch him the next day he gives you a thorough full in-depth analysis of every single player that played that night make sure to go check it out we'll catch you we out